Okay. Moving on to new business. Um, <clears throat> we have a presentation uh, by Barbara Reed from NHMA, the New Hampshire Municipal Association, on the retirement system and the uh, Decennial Commission's report and recommendations. So I'd like to welcome Mrs. Reed for coming again to Claremont. You were here, I forgot how long ago it was, but you it have- was in February last year. Oh, so it's <laughs> almost a year. It's becoming an annual visit. Yeah. All right. Yes. Well, thank you again for being here. Yeah. You're traveling all the way from Concord, right? Yes. Okay, so um, thank you. I'm very happy to be here um, at the mayor's request to talk to you about the New Hampshire um, retirement system. And um, I understand that some of you were here last year when I did the presentation. I don't expect that you remember everything that I talked to you about, um, but I know some of you are new to the council or, or weren't here at last year's presentation. So I thought what I would do was start with sort of a review, sort of a refresher for those of you that were here and sort of an overview of the retirement system for those of you that are, are somewhat uh, new to this. And um, then what I did want to talk about was the decennial commission report uh, I'll talk about what the decennial commission was and their recommendations and then specifically get into some of the legislation that we're dealing with right now um, based on those recommendations of the decennial commission so um, you should all have um, the presentation I did the slides which um, I find that as they say, a picture's worth a thousand words. I think a picture's worth a thousand numbers. So um, what I've done is put together some graphs just to sort of show you some of the trends with the New Hampshire retirement system. And this very first one shows you the number of active members of the New Hampshire retirement system. So that would be um, employees, teachers, police, firefighters, both state, um, local, local being school districts, counties, cities, towns, village districts um, involved in the retirement system. And the blue lines, the blue bars, show you the number of retirees. So um, not really unexpected. If you, if you look back in um, 2007, the ratio of the active members to the number of retirees was about two and a half to one. So there were about two and a half active members um, contributing into the retirement system for every retiree that was drawing from the retirement system. And obviously, as we know, we're, we're sort of somewhat aging here. Um, so, and we're seeing those baby boomers age out. So you can see that where we are in 2017, it's about one and a third to one is where it is. So the, you know, the active numbers, the active numbers of participants has, it, it declined for a few years, not unexpected with the recession that we went through. A lot of municipalities were um, eliminating positions through attrition kind of thing, and maybe not necessarily, um, you know, refilling those position afterwards. So it's it's not surprising that there was somewhat of a decline, and you can see there were about 48,000 uh, participants, active participants for the last several years. But obviously the number of retirees is increasing. Um, this slide just shows you the employer contributions from 2001 until 2017. And again, this is what the employers are paying into the New Hampshire retirement system. These are in millions of dollars. So you can see back in 2001, it was uh, $75 million collectively. Again, that includes the state of New Hampshire as well as all the local governments. And now the contributions um, for 2017, and this is as of June 30th of uh, 2017, was about 425 five million dollars for about the same number of employees yeah and obviously um, there's been payroll growth so that certainly comes into play with paying more but as we'll see the rates um, the rates for the retirement system have in increased significantly which is a large portion of that um, 
and it, again, as I mentioned, it does include that the state is about a 25, roughly a 25 percent participant. So when we talk about uh, anything with local governments, it's about 75 percent. So the state's about 25 percent. Um, this just shows you the same red bars. That is the employer's contribution with the blue bars that are the employee's contribution. Um, and a couple of things to point out here, you see that spike in 2007 with the employee's contribution. That was a, uh, a provision that allowed uh, employees to do um, voluntary um, purchases of service time, and it was a program that was going to end, so it's sort of, oops, it sort of uh, spiked a lot of interest, so that's why there was um, a significant amount of employee con extra extra employee contributions that year. Um, the other one I want to point out is right here, 2012. You see it's sort of a jump right there, and that was when the employees' contribution rate was increased. For Group One, it had been um, a five percent contribution and in 2011 the legislature increased that to um, 7 percent as well as the police and fire had also been increased so that's that's the increase you see there so um, just wanted to mention too with the those contribution rates the employees rates are set by statute so they are in state law the employers contribution rates are based on a formula um, based on how much money is needed to fund the system and that is why the employer rates uh, fluctuate and that's why they change every two years the retirement system goes through a rate setting process every two years and it's basically the um, employers rates that have to make up whatever the difference is that needs to fund the system because the employer rates are not set by statute but the employee rates are um, the next Oh, there we go. Um, this this is um, a chart that is out of the New Hampshire Retirement System's annual report, and this shows you what their <laughs> investment earnings have been for the last ten years. And the investment earnings are um, really important to the system because the employer and the employee's contributions fund about 25 percent to a third of what's needed in the system and about two-thirds to 75 percent of the rest of the money comes from the investment earnings. So the investment earnings are um, really important in terms of the funding of the system. You can see in 2009, um, 2008, 2009, when we had the recession, the retirement system lost about 18 percent of the value of its portfolio. Um, that was that wasn't as bad as a lot of other public pension systems but obviously that still really hurt and as I said when um, when there's a, when the rev, when the investment earnings aren't coming in as expected it's the employer rates that have to make up that difference now we see here um, that we've had some pretty whoops Sorry, we've had some pretty good returns since then. You can see it's over 10 percent um, this past year. I think it was about 13 and a half percent. But there's some years here where it, you know it didn't quite hit the mark. And the mark that they're trying to hit is seven and a quarter percent. That is their assumed rate of return is seven and a quarter percent. It had been much higher for a number of years. But it, um, the Board of Trustees has gradually lowered that down. And why that's important is, again, for their biennial rate setting purposes, they look at the payroll for all of the employers, and they can project what that payroll is going to be and how much will come in from the employee contributions and how much will come in from the employer contributions based on that known payroll. But then they have to make an assumption, how much are we going to get from our investment earnings? So that when they assume they're going to get seven and a quarter percent, what happens is if they don't hit that mark, 
then it creates an unfunded liability. If they go over the mark, that's, that's a good thing. Um, but we'll see in a minute, we do have a big hole that has to be filled. So again, right now, their assumed rate of return is seven and a quarter percent. That may sound rather high um, for some of you. Obviously, looking here, you can see, you know, it's sort of up, it's low, it's up, it's low. Um, in terms of uh, where that lies compared to other public pension systems, I'd say we're, we're sort of right in the middle or maybe a little bit more conservative than a lot of other public pension systems right now. Um, okay. And this is the graph that um, shows you what's known as the unfunded liabilities. Um, this, is, this is the hole that um, the retirement system needs to fill. So right now, what, what this is referring to is if you, uh, when the actuaries look at what do we need to pay all the pension obligations that we have for all the active and the retired members, all what our obligations are, um, they look at the, that and say, okay, that is X number of dollars. How much, what do we have for assets? What are the assets to pay those? Right now, the system has 62% of the assets that they need to pay for all those liabilities. So there is a shortfall, and that is this unfunded liability. Now, the thing to keep in mind, both with that assumed rate of return as well as this unfunded liability, is that um, we're not expecting every single member of the retirement system to retire tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. We're, the retirement system looks, really looks at a 30-year horizon in all their projections. So even with those, um, that assumed rate of return, they're not looking short-term at that. They're looking at long-term, what do we think we, our average investment returns can be over a 25 to 30-year horizon? And the same thing here. Yes, it would be wonderful, if we were 100% funded, that's where we like to be, that's where the goal is, but the fact that the system is not 100% funded doesn't mean that it's going to have any immediate consequence to any retirees. They're going to get their monthly pension payments, it's built in um, to the system, and uh, there is a plan to pay off this unfunded liability. And this was a plan that was put in um, about eight years ago. And it was at that time there were a number of reasons why uh, this, this deficit occurred. And I, I'm not going to go into all the history of that, but let's just uh, accept the fact that there was a deficit with the retirement system. And at the time that that was finally realized and they got a good handle on what the dollar amounts were, they put in what was called an amortization uh, period where they were going to amortize that cost over 30 years. So we are eight years into that. It's basically like a mortgage. So think of it like a 30-year mortgage. So we've got this huge hole, this huge deficit that has to be paid off. It's going to be paid off over 30 years. We are eight years in. We have 22 more years to pay this off. All right. <clears throat> I wanted to just show you um, the rates here for the employees and the teachers, and we'll look at the police and fire. So these are the rates that are being paid right now. And again, as I said, the rates are set every two years. The next um, rate setting will be effective for July 1st of 2019. And I believe the retirement system is going to come out with some preliminary numbers within the next couple of months. They try to get those, um, those rates out about a year ahead of time so that um, employers can have time to budget for those in your normal budget process, particularly when the rates um, are going up. So we do expect to see some projections for those new rates um, in the next couple of months. So these are the rates that are being paid right now. And the normal cost is really um, paying what the, um, the for the retirement benefits that are being earned right now. So as people work, they're building up their their, um, their pension benefits, so that's what that normal cost is paying that. Then you can see in red the unfunded liability. So that's how much is being um, employers are, pay, are, are paying towards um, the deficit. 
towards that unfunded liability. So you can see um, it's almost as much as you're paying for the normal cost, and in the case of teachers, it's even higher. So then the next one is the total cost of those um, two numbers. There's the member contributions, in this case for employees and teachers, it's both 7%. Um, so then it, it shows you what the employer is actually paying for the, the pension. But again, remember, out of that, if you look at the employees, out of this 11%, almost 9% is paying off the deficit, okay? Um, there's a medical subsidy that um, certain, um, certain employees that meet certain criteria are eligible to get. That is added to the employer rate so there is the rate um, that you're paying right now. And it looks like you can't quite see this on the screen, and hopefully you can see it on your page. And what I wanted to show you for the teachers was uh, in the past, the state had paid 35% of the pension cost for um, teachers, police, and firefighters. And in 2000 and uh, 2011, 2012, they started ratcheting that 35% down and down, and eventually eliminated it. So they're not paying that contribution anymore. So what this shows is that if they had been still paying that 35% for the teachers, instead of having 17, 17.36%, um, the state would have picked up 35% of that cost, and the rate would have been 11.28. The next page is similar. This is showing you police and fire, and again, the same, same thing. The normal cost is what employers are paying to cover the pension benefits that are being earned by your active employees right now. And here's the unfunded liability, and in both the, both the case of the police and the fire, that unfunded liability piece is more than what you're paying for that normal cost. Um, again, add those together and then you see the member contributions. Member contributions are higher for police and fire. And generally the reason, um, the reason that is is because uh, police and fire can retire sooner than teachers and employees. So because they can retire sooner and have their so-called full pension with um, fewer years in than the other members, that means they're going to have their, they're going to be drawing their pension for a longer period of time. So um, that is generally why the costs are higher and why the member contribution is higher. Again, you see the medical subsidy there and the total rates at the bottom. And then, if again, if the state was paying that 35% on police and the 35% for fire, it would be almost a 10% reduction in the employer's um, cost to the retirement system per year. <clears throat> and this next graph is the one that just shows you the employer rates and what's happened with the employer rates since 2002. So um, the see the red line is fire that makes sense the blue line is police on some of my graphs I've done those opposite and totally confuses people so the the, the red line is the fire the blue lines police uh, and then we have sort of a purple line that is the teachers and the green line is your um, employees so you can see um, the employer rates obviously have gone up significantly over this period um, huge jump right here in 2011, per particularly police, fire, and teachers. That was when the, the state eliminated that 35% contribution. So that was when employers had to pick that up. And then there's another pretty significant leap right here. That was when the retirement system lowered that assumed rate of return. And again, based on the recommendations they got from their investment managers, the recommendations they got from their actuaries, uh, there was a feeling that the assumed rate of return that they had been using in the past was more aggressive than it should have been. So they lowered that assumed rate of return. So when the actuaries set the rates for the next biennial <coughs> period, they were using a lower assumptions of investment returns coming into the system 
and again because the employees contributions is fixed by statute the difference is made up in the employer rate so that's why there's an increase there now I haven't seen the rates that are coming out for the next I uh, haven't seen that draft or those preliminary rates but I'm getting wind that because of the good investment earnings because of the way um, the way they spread out the gains and losses they they take any losses and spread them out over five years so we're really not having huge spikes so in really really good years they spread that money over five years the investment earnings in really really bad years they spread that out so the, that really bad year in um, 2009 oops they've gotten um, they've spread that out so we're not you're not going to be absorbing any more of the losses from 2009 and we've got a bunch of kind of good years uh, in the recent past so I'm optimistic about what the um, next rates will be but um, I don't want to get you all excited about it because <laughs> I haven't <laughs> seen them but I do expect that we'll see those again those preliminary numbers and I'm I'm usually right there because I want to let our members know what those are going to be and I'm really hoping that we're going to get some good news and at least stay where we are which would be wonderful not to have any increases in the next biennium or maybe have some slight decreases but don't hold me to that yet yet <laughs> um, so that's sort of a little bit of the history and I didn't know if if anybody had any questions on that that I could answer before we get into the decennial commission sure yeah. so going back to your rates of return and I think I asked this question when you were out here previously if your goal is about seven and a quarter percent mm -hmm. why do you use actively managed strategies you're paying enormous amounts of money to fund managers you could basically put all this in like a Vanguard exchange traded fund and track the S&P 500 and probably do 8% every single year um, without the ups and downs and you'd pay hmm. hundreds of thousands of dollars less per every million that you have managed um, well now understand I'm not on the retirement system board of trustees um, but I can tell you that um, back 10 years ago it was the board of trustees that were sort of the investment committee that did the oversight of the um, of all the investment managers and, and were so the oversight um, 10 years ago when there was that what we consider the first decennial commission report in 2007 one of their very strong recommendations was that there be an independent investment committee established that have invest really investment experts on that committee um, to take on that role rather than having the board of trustees do that and my understanding as a result of listening to the the current decennial committee discussions about that is that um, the retirement system at least from the terms of their investment returns compared to their peers other public pension systems and they're in a consortium of like 120 public pension systems so they have quite a few to, that they can compare themselves and benchmark uh, I think they had been down somewhere in like the bottom third and are now up around in the in the top 10 percent or t at the 90 percent mm -hmm. um, in terms of the returns so that's the answer I would have is that the um, the the legislative strategy to deal with this was to create this investment committee to try and improve the return on the investments um, and the decennial commission basically didn't make any recommendations this this current commission did not make recommendations to change that they felt that the investment committee was accomplishing what they had sought to do when they created it so kind of a long answer yeah, yeah, I think I can read between the lines, okay. though. <laughs> so on <clears throat> your investment earnings, for example, you have 2011 at 23% uh, approximately. Mm -hmm. Does all that go back into the fund, or does some of that go into another fund? No, all of this goes into the pension fund. It used to, years ago, um, there was a, a special account 
that was set up and what happened with that was that anything that was over half a percent more than what they assumed they were going to get went into a special account that was used to give additional benefits. Now the problem is if you're taking all the money, you know, if you if you're taking that money in the good years, there's nothing to compensate in the bad years. Remember that fund, that's what I was asking. And that question. special account. So they they've um, stopped doing the game sharing. So all of this again because there's there's this huge hole right now. There's a um, you know, five billion dollar deficit in the system, so there is no gain sharing right now. So all of that is going <coughs> into the, the pension fund. If the gain sharing hadn't been there, it would probably be much less of a. If hole the gain there. sharing had not been there, it would have been a billion dollars less. The hole would have been a billion dollars less. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You said that the the unfunded, it's like a thirty year mortgage. Yep. How come we're however many years into it and the amount owed isn't going down that's I mean, a good, it's still on the incline yeah it's still on the incline and um, part of that is um, part of that is when the um, the assumed rate of return was lowered it hits that unfunded liability and so that then is reflected there too because the employers aren't making up all of that in one year so it sort of hits that unfunded liability so that's part of it and to be honest with you um, the actuaries have explained and I have probably heard it a dozen times about something they called negative amortization and how there's there's a curve and it's going to grow and then it's going to start heading down and we're close to the point where it's going to start heading down and honestly I I've heard it and I can't explain it so <laughs> so but we're slightly down <laughs> and I understand we're hitting that part of the curve where it's going to go down more. Okay. Some of it too, we have less active employees. The fewer employees paying less active, yes. Um, yeah, Mary just said, is it true that we, it's, it's part of that because we have less active employees? What, um, I think that's part of it, but you have to remember if we have fewer active employees, we have fewer people earning the benefits. So they're not earning it. So that's sort of a double-edged thing. So it's not just it's not just one-sided. They're not not as many paying in, but there's not as many that are earning future benefits. Does that make sense? Okay. Just for those not familiar with the system, can you explain the groups? The group one, two, three. Sure. Um, so these are considered the group one, um, and group one are your em employees. It would be your non-public safety and non-teacher. So if you had your DPW, your librarian, Mary, any employees like that are your group one employees. Your group, um, also in group one are, are your teachers. And generally, um, these are employees that, um, you know, to reach their full retirement benefits have to work at least, um, have to work 30 years. Um, age 60 was their retirement age. Um, some of the changes that were done in 2011 made some changes to that to um, increase the age, but that's that's basically the group one folks. And then the group two is the police and fire. Um, and with those, it had been uh, 20 years of service, age 45, when they could retire. And again, um, in 2011, there were some changes to gradually increase that for, for new hires. So um, looking at a little bit longer time and a little bit older age of retirement for the group two members right. any other questions on sort of the background information okay so decennial commission so back in 2007 uh, we were looking at some significant issues with the retirement system and there was pulled together by statute um, a commission <coughs> involving a lot of stakeholders to look at the viability of the New Hampshire retirement system and to come up with recommendations as to um, what type of improvements needed to be done. That commission in 2007 um, made a lot of recommendations, many of which did result in statute changes, law changes in 2009 and 2011, including some of the ones I just mentioned with the increase in the employee contributions, with the uh, l working longer, um, eliminating that gain sharing, you know, those were some of the changes. The, um, the investment committee, all of those were part of 
you know, sort of the result of that um, 2011 commission. And at the same time, what was decided was that it was a good idea to have that kind of comprehensive review, and it should be done at least once every 10 years. So 2017 was the year to have that uh, a similar commission pulled together to review the retirement system. So the decennial commission from um, met last fall, um, and they, um, they had a number of charges that they were supposed to look at. I believe I sent a link to just a, a few pages out of their report. The report is rather lengthy, but I did send um, a couple did I send that to you? Yes. Um, I did send that report, just the sort of the first couple of pages that give you some background information, their executive summary, what their charges were, and their recommendations. So um, that committee did meet and issued their report at the end of December. Um, their report is online if you really want to get into the weeds of some of this. Um, so these are some of the, I, I'd say, more substantial recommendations that I just wanted to cover with you and then talk about some of the legislation that goes along with this. So one of the things that um, the, the commission did recommend, uh, because their charge was to look at the impact of the retirement rates on employers, so their, it, as part of their deliberations, um, they discussed the state subsidy, that state contribution for teachers, police, and firefighters, and recommended that, that the state consider subsidizing some amount. They didn't, they didn't say 35%. They, they weren't going to pin themselves down to an amount. But in um, recognizing that that was a significant impact on employers, they did recommend that the state reinstate some type, some level of subsidy for teachers, police, and firefighters. Um, another issue that they um, unfortunately did not spend a lot of time talking about was retirees returning to work after they retire. And the reason they didn't spend a lot of time mm -hmm. talking about it was because early on in their deliberations, um, the actuaries presented um, in a lot of information to them and told them retirees returning to work in part-time positions doesn't have any financial impact on the system. It's, it's, if it, there is an impact, it's minuscule, it's, it's not an issue. So they really didn't do anything with that until about two or three meetings before their, the end of their time to meet when they decided they needed to address um, what I think is more of a perception problem than it is a financial problem. And that perception is out there, and we see it in occasionally in the union leader headlines that a full-time position has been converted to a part-time position to save on retirement costs, the double dipper, so to speak. Um, but that, so that's what they, they kind of jumped on uh, near the end of the time that they were, um, they were meeting. And their recommend, recommendation was um, to look at that, that 32 hours per week limit that's in the law right now. So you can hire back a retiree and they can't work more than 32 hours per week. Um, they, the recommendation was to drop that to 1,040 hours, which is an average of 20 hours per week. They also felt that they needed some type of a grace period so somebody doesn't retire on Friday and come back to work on Monday in a part-time position, so they um, recommended a 60-day grace period. One of the things that they also did, which is uh, good for employers, was to recommend an annual reporting rather than the monthly reporting that's done right now because the monthly reporting doesn't always tie in with payroll periods, so it would be an annual reporting. And they recommended that there be a significant penalty if a retiree works more than the hours that are allowed in that part-time position. Um, they also recommended on uh, dealing with additional benefits. Um, there's a lot of concern on the part of retirees because we are uh, one of the few public pension systems that don't have built-in cost of living adjustments. So our retirees don't get any adjustment unless that money is specifically a appropriated right now. And again, years ago when there used to be that special account when it was taking some of that those so-called excess investment earnings, there was that special account cost of living adjustments were being granted, but there hasn't been anything for probably um, 
six, seven, eight years. So that is a concern. Um, so one of their recommendations was to do this $500 temporary supplemental allowance, so it's just a one-shot deal of giving an extra $500 to certain retirees, particularly those that have very low pensions. The other issue is um, for the group one, so that's your employees and teachers. Um, for those that retire before age 65, um, they receive a pension, but w once they hit age 65, their pension drops down. And I think the understanding was that was when Social Security kicked in. But now Social Security doesn't necessarily kick in at age 65. For some of them, it's, it's later. Um, but our statute says at age 65, their pension is going to drop down. And so there was concern that, um, that it should at least be tied in to the Social Security full retirement age. Um, and with that one, it's, it's all about the money, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, unfunded liability, they looked at the unfunded liability and said they confirmed that they wanted to leave the existing amortization through 2039, so that's that 30-year payoff of that so-called mortgage. And as I said, we're eight years in, got 22 years left. So 2039 will be when that is paid off. They also recommended something called layered amortization, which basically says, you know, if we have any gains or losses in the future, rather than just putting them into that pot that is going to be paid off over the next 22 years, let's just take each one of whatever happens that year and pay it off over another 20-year cycle so that you can better identify what are the gains and losses and what ha what's affecting that unfunded liability. And the real idea here is if, if we got down to the part point where we only had three or four or five years left to pay off the unfunded liability and we had another 2019 where there was a huge loss of the investments, we'd have to make up all of that loss in those last five years because that's that was the amortization period. It all has to be paid off by 2039. So by putting in this other statute, it, it helps spread if they're in the event that there is something like a 2009, it wouldn't have to all be paid off by 2019. It would spread it out a little longer. And, and that was sort of in the realm of their charge with looking at how can they help stabilize the rates for employers so they're not you know, consistently seeing these increases. So that was one of the responses there. And the last one is this level dollar amortization. And this is really, you know, pretty basic. It basically says if employers would just pay off that unfunded liability sooner, it would cost a lot less. Same thing like your mortgage. If you paid it off in 10 years instead of 20, it would, it's in the long run, it's going to cost you a lot less. The question is where you're going to get all the money Right. to pay it off sooner. And um, with that, it was going to be about $100 million more next year if they had changed to that. So that's the issue there. So those were the sort of the major recommendations. So I did want to just um, touch on some of the legislation that we're, we're dealing with right now with the legislature. So right now we have House Bill 413. This was a bill that was introduced last year. And it was a bill to restore a portion of that state contribution for teachers, police, and firefighters. And um, it was only going to do at 15 percent, but that would have saved local governments about $43 million. Again, cities, towns, school districts, counties, all collectively, but still $43 million. Um, the bill passed in the House last year came out of the policy committee um, that it should be killed. But the House passed it, huge margin. I mean, we don't usually see margins like this, 267 to 83. The bill was then sent to the um, House Finance Committee. They held on to the bill and said, let's see what the Decennial Commission recommends. Um, Decennial Commission came out with their recommendation, but House Finance said, no, we don't have the money recommended to kill the bill. It went to, um, it went to the House in the beginning of January and it failed and the, the bill died in the House. They did kill it. But look at the vote, 172 to 166. It was a very close vote. It was just six votes different. So if only four representatives had voted differently, it would have passed. Um, 
So what's happened is, because it was such a close vote, there has been um, a movement to reconsider that vote. One of the representatives that voted on the prevailing side, one of the reps that voted to kill it, has agreed to ask for reconsideration of that. So that is coming up in the next House session, which I believe is February 7th. There's going to be a motion to reconsider. Um, I looked at your representatives. Three of your four representatives um, voted against the motion to kill it, so they wanted to um, fund it. Um, but one representative did vote with the majority to kill it. So um, the, the message we want our members, you to get out to your representatives is when this comes up for reconsideration to vote yes on reconsidera reconsidering it. The, I think the first motion is going to be inexpedient to legislate, meaning let's kill it again. Uh, vote no on that. There's going to be an amendment to change the effective date so that it doesn't hit the state budget this year, but it would be a directive to the state that for the next biennial budget to put the 15 percent uh, cost for that contribution, state contribution, in the state budget. So they have to vote on that amendment to change that effective date and then vote on the bill ought to pass. So we're hoping, we're hearing from some reps, they didn't understand this bill. They thought voting on it would get, put a $40 million hole in the state budget today. Um, so we're, we're, we're hearing some momentum, we're on it, so hopefully that will um, pass and then we can bring it to the Senate. Yeah. Just, just for the <laughs> viewing public at home, besides the message of you know, talking to our state reps, can you give us who voted for and against? Um, yeah, for on statewide, you mean? No, for our our delegation here. Yes, I believe it was. Do you have a representative O'Connor? Yep. Yes. Voted against it, so voted um, voted to kill the bill. Okay. The other three um, voted not to kill the bill. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Sorry, you yeah. you have that slide in the packet. Um, excuse me. You have that slide in the packet. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It in here and you hear yes okay i'm sorry you can't hear me yes yeah we um we in the last session we testified on uh, for that bill and had a i believe we had a joint letter signed by both the city council and the school board Perfect. in favor we will revisit that and ensure that we um, re-energize that effort that I was going to ask you to do that. In fact, I brought you some sample letters. We discussed this with our board last Friday and had a couple of our board members jumped right on this and have already um, drafted letters and specifically told their representatives the dollar amount, the effect on the property tax that this has. And I was going to um, ask you to do the same. And it sounds like you have a meeting with your school board, which would be great to, because I know they're independent from the city. Right, school but one district. of our... Yeah. Our agenda items on that for that meeting is to um, discuss uh, 2018 priorities and because of the impact to the community as a whole, I hope the two governing bodies will agree on educational funding, but this will also, um, because we'll talk about funding that imp or lack thereof that impacts the community, this will be one of the topics. Yeah. And. Um, I know some of you get our legislative bulletin we'll yes. be talking about. We'll be writing about this on Friday and then the next week, too. I must, I don't quite know the order that they'll be taking things up uh, with that amendment and expedient to legislate and everything, but we're hoping to get that pinned down. Perfect. And it will be in our bulletin in the next two weeks. Okay, any other questions on that? Yeah. Well, this might be for Mary. Maybe she could work this up for us. But what would be the impact of a 15% state contribution to our Police and fire. Um, Just police and fire. Yeah. I do. I could go look it up. Maybe. Yeah, at some point. Yep. Yep. Mr. McNutt, uh, while I'm thinking of it, could those figures be um, provided in preparation for our joint meeting? Uh, and I'll. Uh, we can ask mm -hmm. uh, the school board chair to direct uh, the superintendent to do the same. Yeah, I'm gonna. I, I should talk to Middleton tomorrow morning. I can ask him then to have okay. his finance folks try to put it together. It'll probably be good if we have the chair okay. directed. Okay. 
Uh, this is a, a great presentation that you have, um, and I know you're uh, here on behalf of NHMA, not the state. Um, but as a request, mm -hmm. could you add a slide that talks about the costs of the New Hampshire retirement system, how much it costs to administer it, um, both you know state administration employees and how much it, uh, is paid in fees to uh, financial consultants and managers? Yeah, I believe their administrative costs are about 35 basis points, but I don't believe that includes the fees to their managers. But I can look, I, yes, to the extent I can, yes, I can find that in their annual report. Yep, and provide that. Okay. Barbara? Yep. I noticed that it restores the state contribution for teachers, police, and fire, but it omits employees. The, the state never contributed towards the cost of employees. Just to make sure that that's clear. Yeah, and and I think part of that was um, before there was the New Hampshire retirement systems, there were separate police retirement, fire retirement, teacher retirement, and the state actually contributed to those systems back then. So when the, the they consolidated it, obviously they wanted all of these to come together and that was sort of the carrot that they put out there too was that they would continue with the 35 percent contribution for teachers police and fire but employees never never had that it was never that contribution all right um all right the next one is house bill 561 this is the bill dealing with those um retirees that are returning to work um, so as I as I mentioned, the decennial commission made a few recommendations. One of which was to drop the hours down to an average of 20 hours per week. Right now, it's it's 32 hours per week, um, and and a couple of other recommendations. House Bill 561 was a bill from last session that was dealing with this issue and was held in one of the Senate committees. So once the decennial commission came out with their report. Um, Senator Carson, who chairs that committee, uh, put the recommendations right on House Bill 561. Uh, it, came, it passed in her committee by, by a vote of three to two, and it was going right to the Senate floor uh, for that first Senate session in January. And our concern was none of this got a public hearing. There was no public input to the decennial commission, primarily because they didn't talk about it until the very end of their work. Um, and, and we felt this was a very significant change that there should have been public input on. When it went to the um, Senate floor that first week in January, uh, there was an amendment and uh, at the lunch break, quite a few of us um, grabbed the ears of several senators and the recommendation when they re um, reconvened after lunch was that there be, that it, it go back to the committee to hold a public hearing on that amendment, uh, it, which is what they did. It was about a three hour public hearing. There was a lot of municipal officials, particularly a lot of law enforcement folks. And, you know, it was certainly an eye opener for me. I learned an awful lot about um, what our law enforcement workforces are facing around the state you know this isn't just about a police chief retiring and taking a part-time job to get both his pension and his pay I, I, in a lot of our smaller towns there's just a, a lot of municipalities that have to rely on, on part-time retired officers because they can't find new recruits they particularly in some of our smaller communities um, and and especially with um, you know a lot of the issues that they're dealing with um, so this is this is a huge issue. I did ask um, Mary about your situation. It looks like you have um, four retirees that are working in law enforcement for you in various positions. And again, I think what I saw for Claremont was very similar. What we were hearing from a lot of other municipalities, they're not necessarily coming back into you know kind of boots on the ground police officers, but they're doing other types of things. I think you've got somebody that's uh, assists the prosecutor. You've got somebody that's your parking enforcement person. So you know they're coming back in other positions. Um, so again, this is a huge issue. After that hearing, um, it was the committee decided to make some amendments to what was being proposed. So this is what stands right now, is that um, any retiree working less than 1,300 hours per year, which is an average of 25 per week, is fine. If they're going to work between 1,300 and 1,600, so basically up to 32 and a half hours a week, 
there would be a surcharge charged to both the retiree on their compensation, 3%, and to the employer, 5% on, on that compensation. This is not a contribution to the retirement system in terms of increasing the retiree's benefits. This is just paying in to pay off that unfunded liability sooner. That's all this is. Um, there was a decision to grandfather any retirees that are currently in part-time positions, but it's only grandfathering those in that specific position. So if they change positions, they're not grandfathered any longer. Or if you have a position that somebody is a retiree in, in right now and they decide to really retire and go to Florida and you go to fill that position with another retiree, that's not grandfathered. So it's not the person that's grandfathered, not the position. It's the person in that position, in that specific position that would be grandfathered. There's a very stiff penalty if the retiree exceeds 1,600 hours per year. Their pension, uh, the state portion of their pension would be suspended for the following 12 months. Really put the onus on the employee to uh, manage that and track that. Um, the the 60 day grace period um, raised some concerns because I guess police officers lose their certification. Um, after 30 days if they're not in some type of uh, law enforcement position. So that was uh, reduced to 28 eight day grace period where you can't return to work for 28 days. Um, if they still retain the annual reporting for employers instead of that monthly reporting. It passed the Senate on a vote of 17 to seven. Um, it was quite a heated debate. And because it has a fiscal impact, it's, go it's going to the Senate Finance Committee. We expect that the bill will change and be amended because in talking with the retirement system, there's a lot of provisions that are in here that they just don't understand. Some of what's being explained is not what exactly the bill says. You know, so there's, there's still some work that needs to be done. There are also those that want to raise the limit up to you know, closer to 29 or 30 hours average per week instead of the, the 25 hours. Um, obviously, we have a concern about this surcharge. I know I have an awful lot of our members that are saying this has always been a part-time position. It's never been part of the retirement system. Why would I have to start paying into the retirement system now when this has never been a full-time position? They're not earning any benefits. And it's, it's the answer is because it's a, a perception issue that some people think that should be a full-time position if somebody's filling it for 30 hours or more. Um, so we're expecting more activity on this, and I'm sure the way the bill stands right now is not going to be the way it passes. Um, any questions on that? Oh, has, yep. has the state actually looked at how many individuals are returning back to positions where they're working part-time? <laughs> versus hourly rates versus what they're actually making overall compensation while collecting retirement and not paying into the system? Um, yes, the retirement system did a report. Um, we actually asked them you know, to just pick a sample month. They pick, picked last September because that would have teachers in there and you know, maybe some still Hampton Beach firefighters that are working Labor Day weekend and those kinds of things. So there's about 28,000 retirees, about 2,400 of those retirees. So about 8% are back working in part-time position. Of those um, 2,400, about 1,500 are working less than 20 hours a week. So it's really about 500 or so that are working more than 25 hours. But again, in some of our member municipalities, and I don't know if you have some working 32 hours or yeah. more. No, everybody's under 28 right now. Everybody's yeah. under 28, but they're over 25. Yes. They're over 25, so Two out of the four. So unless they can cut their hours back to stay within those limits, you'd be paying in on you know the 5%, and you'd probably end up paying the, the, their 3% because they probably have more pay. <laughs> that would be my guess. So, um, so that's sort of the population we're looking at. Is that what you were asking? Yeah, I was looking at <clears> seeing if they actually ran the numbers to see how many were actually doing it. Because you run the you know the double-edged sword of if you have employees that are doing 32-hour positions that once were full-time, now they're collecting their full-time you know, retirement benefits and they're occupying a full-time position in reality where they're not paying in. Of course, and you're not getting the funds from both sides from the employee and the employer. Right. Right. 
and and you know a lot of these employees um you know the pensions you know we have a, a relatively modest pension program the ones you hear about are really the outliers i think the average pension is under thirty thousand a year it is not the sixty seventy eighty thousand dollar pensions that make the headlines um the, the bulk of them are far more modest um, than what is reported um, in the media. So you certainly can understand why somebody wants to come back and work, whether for their former employer or a different employer. And these are public people that have been in public service their whole careers. Um, it, it makes sense that this is where they want to be, as well as the expertise and the knowledge base that they bring. Um, so it's just sort of a, a, we see it as a sort of a win-win. And there are some senators that say, hey, these people earned their pension. They worked for 30 years. They earned it. Do we really care if a city or town wants to hire them back in a part-time position? It's none of the state's business. We like hearing that. We just don't have enough senators saying that. <laughs> so, okay, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> All right, just real quick, I have just, I think, two other slides. Um, a couple of bills dealing with additional benefits. As I mentioned, we don't the the pension system doesn't provide automatic colas so this is something that the legislature has been struggling with um, a one and a half percent cost of living adjustment for all retirees um, that have been retired at least five years costs 51 million dollars and part of the reason that is it's not just the one and a half percent on what they're getting today but they're going to get that for this year and next year and the following year and you know every year they're going to whatever that one and a half percent that they're increased they're given today that is going to still be paid out in years and years and years ahead so that when the actuaries look at that and of course they assume some people are going to drop off but the overall cost is 51 million so just to give a one and a half percent cola this year would cost 51 million dollars and if it, another one and a half percent cola was given again next year it would be another 51 million dollars to make sure that's what's called terminally funded so you're funding all of that the whole period it's a lot of money um, the $500 temporary supplemental allowance again that's that one-time deal um, for retirees again with more than five years um, and less than uh, pensions of less than 30,000 that's 10 million dollars so again the state is really struggling with what do we do for these retirees to help them you know deal with the effects of inflation um, with these kind of numbers and then I had mentioned that um, changing the group one from the age 65 to the Social Security retirement age that's 4.3 million dollars to do that so this is all in the House Finance Committee right now and we're watching to see what they're doing with that and then finally, there were um, a couple of bills dealing with the unfunded liability as recommended by the Decennial Commission. One was to study this level dollar amortization. As I mentioned, that's just basically paying off the liability sooner, like paying off your mortgage in 10 years instead of 20 years. Um, if that was in, put in place right now, it would be an extra $100 million that employers would have to kick into the system. And again, it does, it, it Paying it off sooner helps, you know, in the long run, just like, just like with your mortgage. I know I was in shock when you look and see when you're signing those papers when you're buying your first home and they say this is how much the house costs, but, you know, with all the interest over 30 years, this is how much it's gonna, you're really going to be paying. It's exactly that. Um, but as the question was that we pose, where do you think employers are going to get the money to pay it off sooner? including the state because the state would have to be, pay a big chunk of that um, the layered amortization um, I think I, I went into this a little bit it just says your future gains and losses will be um, amortized over 20 years particularly those losses so they they don't have to be all amortized within this um, shorter and shorter period that we're paying off the current unfunded liability so those are um, a couple of bills that we'll be watching in addition to the other ones so, any other questions? Are there any other questions before we close on this? Well, I want to thank you for your time to come back to sure. Amazon, all the way from Concord and for <laughs> once again a very well explained and presented presentation. Um, 
we do as much as we follow these issues especially when they have serious financial impact to the community there are times when either I'm not available or the city manager is unavailable or anybody from the council or the school district is unavailable to testify what in your opinion is the most effective way to gap that absence when they do have the public hearings um, certainly um, writing to the committee and putting it putting it in writing um, to the committee members and particularly if you have representatives or your senator is on a particular policy committee um, I'm not sure which committees it's Senator Hennessy um, yes, sits on but certainly making sure that they know specifically it, it's, it's got to hit home for them yep. and you know we talk sort of in in general about it and big pictures and all you know high numbers high level 30,000 foot review um, but when you bring it home to them and, the, and they they understand that geez that's that's 10 cents on our tax rate or that could be the the, the price of an, a, a, an additional police officer you know that's what really hits home with them um, and I know, you know, even not just with the retirement bills, but I know with other other municipal bills, I've had representatives say if they get five or six phone calls or emails about a specific bill, for some of them that's a lot, and they do take notice. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, is this mine? I've just been yeah, told that one of our invoices is, is on the back of your copy, so you can just tear that off. <laughs> so <laughs> I, don't, I, I grabbed a few things too quickly off our printer <laughs> and stapled them together. <laughs> no? Just on she had to be first. So. She pays the bill. Yeah. She'll take okay. care of it. Thank you. All right, well, thank you again. Um, we will move on to 